Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, first of all, once again, I uh, I have to say thank you for what happened yesterday. Uh, I feel incredible and just just thank you, uh, and that's it. Uh, I'm going to continue recording normal videos, and uh, today I'm going to continue the series on the King's Indian defense, uh, and I'm going to start with the classical King's Indian. We're going to get into that in a moment. And the first variation I'm going to cover is going to be the bayonet attack, which is considered to be the most straightforward way for white to go for an advantage. And it seems to be uh, one of the most popular, if not most popular, variations against the King's Indian. It's also considered the main line of the main line, so it made sense to start with that. In the following videos, we are going to be looking at uh, several different variations of the orthodox or classical King's Indian, and then we are going to uh, move on to other moves on move 5. So instead of knight f3, we are going to cover the same mission and the other variations. Uh, okay, so to start, uh, the opening starts after d4, black plays knight f6, c4, g6, uh, knight c3, and now the opening can still be a Grunfeld with pawn to d5, or the king's Indian with bishop to g7. If you haven't seen the introductory video on the king's Indian, please do. Uh, there I went over the basics and uh, covered some main ideas for both sides. Today we are going to be focusing on the main moves, uh, e4 for white and d6. So with e4, white is basically taking up central space and using the opportunity for uh, to punish black for his modern approach to the opening. So black is neglecting central control, black is not challenging the center with pawns, black is allowing white to, to control the center with several of his pawns. And you can see that after e4, white is controlling f5, e5, d5, c5, and b5, which is an incredible amount of central control. And according to classical uh, chess theory, white is almost winning here. Black, however, goes for a modern or hyper-modern approach, and the King's Indian defense, similar to the modern on the pier or the Pirts, has one idea in mind. Allow White to, uh, to control the center, to overextend, and then punish him for that by destroying his center, la center later. Black is going to do that with his minor pieces and with pawn breaks. The two most usual pawn breaks in the King's Indian are e5 and c5. We are going to focus on e5 today and in several uh, next videos. And the second thing black wants to do is to break through the center with his minor pieces, namely with the king's Indian bishop on g7, which tends to be the stronger, the strongest minor piece black has on the board. So after the move e6, white wants to expand, black wants to let white expand, uh, develop quickly, castle quickly, and then fight for central control later on. So black's next move is d6. This move is logical, opening up the bishop, stopping the immediate e5 in some positions, and the game continues with knight f3. Knight f3 is the normal, uh, the classical, or the orthodox variation. The most common name is the classical king's Indian. As I said, the other moves we are going to look at later on. Now, several moves from this position are uh, the main line, and it goes on for three more moves. Uh, we are going to be focusing on these three moves for, for a while, for several videos. And then we are going to branch out on move 9. So, uh, black in this position castles, and this goes along with his plan of developing quickly, castling quickly, and uh, while at the same time white is trying to expand, expand in the center. So you can see already that white is two moves away from castling, while black's king is already on g8, which is uncommon for, for a defense, for, for an opening you play with black. White continues with bishop to e2. This is the most sensible move. This is now the classical uh, King's Indian. And black plays the move e5. As I said, opening up the center, trying to fight for central control now that his pieces are perfectly placed. His king is safe, his bishop is ready on g7, and he's ready to strike. And with the move e5, black is asking a question to white. What are you going to do? How are you going to react? White can, of course, take the pawn, uh, leave the pawn there, or push the pawn to d5. Uh, today we are going to be focusing on the move castles, so white leaving black the option of capturing the pawn, and we are going to see that, but uh, white can also uh, capture or push immediately. The main move, which is almost always played, is castles. The reason for that is that white is waiting for black to develop his knights to c6, which is a very good square as we are going to see, and he is only then going to push with d5, gaining a tempo with his move. If black ever takes after e5 castles, if black takes, then white is going to have sort of a Marozzi bind structure, which is okay. Uh, this variation uh, is, is fine, I mean, taking here, but it's completely different, and black doesn't have the normal king's Indian plans. So after castles, the main move is knight c6. The point of knight c6 
is that black wants to start a kingside attack. The main theme of the king's Indian is that white is going to be attacking along the queen side, especially in the bayonet attack, as we are going to see, which is the most straightforward way to, to crash through the, king, to queen, the queen side. While at the same time, black wants to play the move f5 and start his kingside attack. Uh, as you may know, the king's Indian is known to be a very aggressive opening in which black goes all in and then white, if he wants to play perfectly, has to go all in as well. And the bayonet attack is... A perfect example of that. So the move knight c6 makes sense. White does get his move d5 in and black plays knight e7. Uh, the point of knight e7 is that the knight is much more useful than on d7. If black on the last move had developed his knight to d7 then of course white wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to gain a tempo with the move d5 but if you look at the position what would the knight be doing on d7? This would be the case of superfluous knights uh, which is known in, in chess theory meaning that two knights uh, are in the way of one another and the two knights basically don't don't allow each other to breed. On the other hand, the knight on e7, which has been used as a tempo gain to, to retreat from c6, is an extremely useful piece, as we are going to see in this variation and in many other variations of the king's Indian. This knight is supporting the move f5, which is black's main idea. Uh, pawn breaks, if, if you haven't seen my video on the pawn breaks, it's in the middle game playlist, uh, see it, it will uh, go much more in depth into what I'm about to say. So basically whenever you want to start an attack with a pawn break, and you have to do that in closed positions, otherwise your pieces are not going to have any room, you want to do that on the side where your pawn chain is facing, where the top of your pawn chain is. Uh, the second strategy would be to undermine the top of your opponent's pawn chain. So black can here either go for c6 or for f5. And since black wants to start a kingside attack, then f5 is the thematic move. And this is basically where the variation starts. From this position on, uh, white can play knight e1, white can play knight d2, white can play bishop g5, bishop d2. We are going to be looking at all of these moves in separate videos, especially knight e1 and knight d2. And today we are going to be focusing on the main move, uh, by far the most commonly played move, uh, 5,780 games, uh, high-level high games with the move b4. b4 is the bayonet attack and this is uh, the most dreaded variation uh, you could play with white against the king's Indian. It's extremely aggressive, it requires extreme precision from both sides and white always has an egging edge if he knows what he is doing. Uh, especially according to the engines, which simply hate the King's Indian for black. But the reality is that the opening gives uh, a tremendous amount of attacking chances to black. Uh, black is the one who is attacking where the king position is. So in this position, you can see that white gave away all of his cards. He is attacking on the queen side. Black is going to attack on the king side. Logically, white is in more trouble if black is faster, because his king is where the attack is going to be. We are going to be looking at three different moves. Knight h5, which is the main move. a5, which is the anti-positional move, but which seems to work. And knight e8, which is, in my opinion, the most aggressive move. Although white can choose to go into lions, which occur after knight h5, as we are going to see. I would first uh, like to look at the move a5, because uh, it's, in my opinion, uh, well... According to some theoreticians of the King's Indian, this is the most aggressive move. Uh, I think that knight e8 is most promising, but, well, the opinions are divided, basically. Uh, a5 has been played only 1300 times, knight h5 has been played 3500 times, knight, knight e8 has been played 500 times. And I think that knight h5 is the most uh, principled move for black. But a5 and knight e8 have something to say for themselves as well. So let's look at the move a5. One thing that I would like to highlight about the bayonet attack is that the variation is extremely forcing. In all three lines that we are going to look at, knight h5, a5 and knight e8, you have to know the theory. It's not that you have to play the only moves, but the other moves are so inferior to what the main theory says that you would basically be losing your game unless you play the theoretical moves. So these variations, soul tree, go more than 25 moves in depth. And for those of you who, who became patrons, uh, who are in the Nimtsovich tier or higher, I'm going to be sending a more in-depth uh, analysis of each variation and we are going to, I'm going to be sending you example games as well. So they're extremely theoretical, more than 25 moves of theory, and it's really uh, not that rare to see Grandmaster games which last for 30 or 35 moves of preparation. 
So we have to know everything. The move A5 is counterintuitive because it's striking where white has more space and where white is starting his attack. It doesn't make any sense. If your opponent has more space on one side of the board, you need to counterattack on the other side of the board, and this is an exception to that. Uh, white reacts with the move bishop a3. After bishop a3, black takes, a takes b4, bishop takes b4. And uh, the point of this maneuver for white is that he is now looking at the tender point d6. As we said, since white wants to strike uh, at the queen side, his main uh, pawn break, his logical pawn break, is the move c5. Attack where your pawn chain is facing. And if you know that c5 is coming, then the bishop on b4 on this diagonal is extremely useful for supporting that. Black now changes stuff a bit and continues with knight to d7. Uh, firstly, he wants to make room for f5. Secondly, he wants to control the c5 square. a4, uh, continuing pushing forward. Bishop h6 is the main move. The bishop isn't really doing much on this diagonal at the moment, and it's going to be supporting uh, f5 and perhaps even f4 or taking on e4. a5, white continues his, king si his queen side attack. f5, black starts his own attack now. For the moment, uh, white's position is pretty tender. You can see that uh, fe4 is a definite possibility, which is probably going to come. So white, for the moment, defends bishop d3. Uh, king h8, this is a prophylactic move, and uh, there's one more reason for this. In some positions, you want to be playing knight g8, knight f6, and in some positions, you want to be playing rook g8. So this is a multi-purpose move, uh, which, which definitely helps, uh, helps black. Rook e1, developing. Knight f6, bringing his knight to f6 into the game, looking at the e4 square, looking at the g4 square, and uh, yeah, starting an attack. And already you can see that all of black's pieces are poised for a kingside attack. And if white isn't careful, if white goes wrong, this could prove deadly in a matter of moves. c5, white continues. So now you can see the main point of the bayonet attack. It's kingside attack for black, queenside attack for white, and neither side really does much to stop their opponent. f4 cd6, cd6, knight e4, knight e4, bishop e4. So this is the forcing part. And you can see that black now has a permanent weakness on e6, white has a weakness uh, on d6, white has a weakness on, on d5, but it's questionable how weak this pawn really is. You can see, and we are, as we are going to see in the main line with knight h5, this pawn can often serve as an outpost uh, for, for the white knight if black ever allows that. And the bishop on h6 is... Its main purpose is to stop knight g5. Bishop f5, trying to exchange the bishops. This bishop was inactive on c8. Queen d3, queen d7, defending the bishop. Queen a3, double attacking the, the d6 pawn. And now bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, knight f5. This is where I would like to stop. And uh, this is still theory. Uh, there are still games from this position, uh, grandmaster games, and... Uh, you can still gain an advantage by knowing several moves in advance, but these 22 moves you're, you simply have to know if you want to play the move uh, a5 on move 9. So if white continues with the bayonet attack, I think that a5 is a very promising uh, promising move, not the best one in my opinion, but anti-positionally positionally in a sense. So after a5, bishop a3, white seemingly gets whatever he wants. a b4, bishop a4, knight d7, controlling c5, and sometimes preparing to go back to f6 after f5, but freeing up a square for the pawn to move, which is essential. If you don't move the knight away, if you don't play f5, you don't have any counterplay. So knight d7, a4, bishop h6, preventing knight g5, because after f5, if knight g5 happens, knight e6 is a threat, which you have to prevent. a5, f5, bishop d3, king h8, a prophylactic move. Rook e1, knight f6, c5. So in the a5 line, you have all the thematic ideas of the king's Indian for both sides. Okay, now let's look at a more aggressive line. Uh, after b4, the move knight e8 uh, is, in my opinion, the most aggressive way to play. And... Very ag aggressive players have been playing it, uh, namely uh, Hikaru Nakamura, Timur Rajabov. Nakamura has uh, a dozen games in this variation, and he wins almost all of them. Uh, he crushed Vichy Anand uh, in the variation in 2011. He crushed Topalov in 2017, and he, he even crushed him twice. So it's a very aggressive line, and you can, you can tell that if Hikaru Nakamura uses it as his main weapon in the King's Indian against the bayonet attack, that there's something uh, to be said about the variation. 
One thing that I would like to mention, as we are going to see in the knight h5 lines, is that if white continues with rook e1, just imagine the knight not being on e8 but on h5, we can get the variation f5, knight g5, and knight f6 from e8. You can get the same line after knight h5, uh, rook e1, f5, knight g5, knight f6. So white can still go for the, for the variation which he uses against knight h5. Uh, for some reason, after knight e8, uh, white uh, has an opportunity, and it's more favorable for white to start a quick attack than to go for rook e1, because knight e1 is a different idea. So, white continues with the move c5, uh, immediately undermining black's standard point in the position the d6 square. Uh, black responds with f5, immediately counterattacking. Knight d2. Knight d2 is important because firstly you defend e4, secondly you prepare for, for either bishop f3 or f3 to defend the e4 square. f3 is going to be played in most games. Knight f6, f3 and f4. And this position, this variation with knight e8 is so extremely uh, aggressive for black because he closes down the lines, he doesn't take on e4. Instead of that he prepares for a full onslaught on the king side by moving his king and playing g5, g4 h5, h4, and simply trying to open up as many lines as, many lines as possible and checkmate the, black, the white king. On the other hand, at the same time, white gets to counterattack on the queen side. And once again, from a human perspective, I think it's much easier to defend the side of the board if your king isn't there. It's much easier for black to defend because the worst thing that can happen is material loss or a positional disadvantage or something like that. For white, the worst case scenario is checkmate. So... In my opinion, this variation is practically better for, for black. That's why I would recommend knight e8. Okay, white continues knight c4. We have g5 starting an attack. a4, white pushes through his own idea. Knight g6. Bishop a3, rook f7. This move is, is extremely important uh, because of one maneuver, uh, and that maneuver is bishop f8. Since you have closed down this diagonal, black's main idea is this line in this line is to be able to reinforce this diagonal. And you can see there's trouble brewing on the diagonal. The c4 knight, the a3 bishop, and the c5 pawn both target the d6 square, and uh, black would easily be in trouble if he lets uh, the pawn fall. Uh, one thing should be said uh, that in this position, after c takes d6, uh, and c takes d6, white cannot really go uh, taking the pawn, there are no tricks, let's say knight takes, queen takes, b5 doesn't really bring bring anything to white, and uh, black is going to be better. So after the, mo the move rook f7, white continues with his most aggressive move, and that's b5. And you can see that uh, this pawn chain is getting incredibly dangerous. One feature of the king's indian is that in the classical uh, or the orthodox king king's indian, you don't exchange many pawns. In fact, very often you don't exchange any pawns in the bayonet attack. So whichever side manages to push their pawns forward uh, more aggressively is going to have an advantage. And here already, if you if you ha had to decide the result of the game uh, with the board divided in two, you would say that it's that black is winning on the king side, white is winning on the on the queen side. Uh, after b5, the position continues. D c5, bishop c5, h5, going for an attack. A5, g4, and this is. Well, uh, it's understandable because neither side has time to waste. Any passive moves could be punished quickly, and you you need to you basically go on it, go all in and try for an attack. If you fail, you lose miserably, and that's it. And for this variation, as well as the a5 one, 25 moves of, of theory. The good news is that the theory is forced. You only need to know one line, perhaps two lines, and if you know it, you're going to have a tremendous advantage over your opponent, who is either going to be wasting time figuring out the moves, or he's going to blunder. So let's continue. b6, uh, white pushes forward, g3. Uh, the best move is king h1. Uh, closing the position down would be extremely dangerous. If h3 is played, then you can see that bishop, uh, bishop h3 is coming at some point. This piece is completely useless on, c, on c8 for the moment, so sacrificing it for the initiative and to be able to gain that pawn break is in incredibly dangerous, so you don't want to provide black a target on, on h3. Bishop f8. Now the thematic maneuver, which was enabled by the move rook f7, d6, ab6, bishop g1, and now you take when you get the tempo on the bishop, gh2, bishop f2. And this pawn, even though it's in the middle of, black's, of white position, white's king position, 
actually serves as a shield and it's going to be easier to defend if you don't take the pawn. If you take the pawn, the lines are opening up, rook h7 is coming up, h4, h3 is coming up and you're going to get checkmated. b a5, knight b5, looking at the c7 pawn, c d6, bishop b6. And this is still theory, this is still a very well-known position, uh, queen d7 is the, is the main move. According to the engines, queen to e7, you can see, is the main move. And white has a slight advantage, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, but from a practical perspective, the advantage is completely irrelevant. And whoever plays uh, more precisely is going to win this game. So if you want a completely crazy King's Indian, I would advise you to play the move knight e8 uh, when you face the bayonet attack. I think it's the most promising uh, try for black. So knight e8, white should continue with c5, rook e1, f5, knight g5, knight f6, bishop f3, the line we are about to see isn't that favorable. And c5 is basically white's only chance to have enough initiative on the queen side to compensate for the king side weaknesses. Uh, the main move uh, against the bayonet attack has only started being played in the last 25 to 30 years. It's sort of a new move. a5 and knight e8 were the main moves uh, before that. And knight h5 is a new development, sort of new development. And once again, the line is forced. The only branching we are going to get is on move 12. After knight h5, the line we saw against knight e8 uh, is the main line here. So rook e1, f5, white uh, has to accept the fact that black gets, gets his pawn break in first, knight g5. And now with this move, white exploits the weakness of the e6 square provided by the d5 pawn. Uh, one other thing that's uh, possible, if black isn't careful, white is threatening to simply take on, on h5. So let's say black plays a stupid move. I don't know, bishop d7, then bishop h5, g h5, queen h5, and 1-0 white wins. So black's next move has to be knight f6. And now we reach the same position as if black had played knight e8. Now here, white can either play f3 or bishop f3. Bishop f3 is the main line. f3 is a sideline which is forced once again 25 or more moves of theory. So let's look at f3 first. After f3, uh, black plays uh, a strange looking move. Uh, king h8, but once again it provides the, it provides the g8 square for the knights, it opens up the g, the g file uh, should black want to put his rook on g8, and it helps in the attack. So king h8, rook b1, helping with the king the queen side attack, h6 chasing the knight away, and now knight e6. And this is what you are going to get in the bayonet attack with knight h5. This uh, move with, which often, uh, if you are uncareful, results in a pawn sacrifice. So bishop e6, d6. This pawn is now loose and black, if he wishes to, can round it up uh, in some positions. Whether he should do it or not, whether he has time to do it or not, is questionable. The main move continues with fe4. fe4, knight c6, now that the d5 pawn is gone. This is a perfect square. And you can see the main feature of this position. A gaping hole on, uh, on d5 for black, which uh, once the knight enters it, if black ever captures, then e d5 or c d5 would create uh, a protected passed pawn on e6 in the middle of black's camp and the position would be almost terminal for black. On the other hand, uh, white also has a huge weakness in his position, that's the d4 square, and the knight from c6 is of course looking at the d5 square, and this is going to be an almost octopus knight controlling several key squares in the, in the middle of white position. Knight d5, for white, black, as we said, shouldn't really be taking that. Uh, is going to be really hard to defend the position with the protected uh, e6 pawn. So knight g8, provided by king h8. And the knight is sometimes rerouting to e7, uh, which might be a useful maneuver. Sometimes it retreats, uh, it retreats back to f6, depending on what, on what white does. In the main line, it will go to f6. Bishop d3, knight d4, queen g4, looking at uh, the, the g6 pawn. It's now undefended. And now g5 defending, h4, and knight f6. Knight f6 is a move which might seem strange, but the point is uh, the point is that black is going to try to defend tactically. Uh, taking on g5 doesn't really work. The queen is uh, attacked, of course, so it's a tempo gain on the queen. So black tries to hold on to his position without blundering anything by, by gaining a tempo on the queen. If uh, white ever captures, then bishop captures is going to be defending. So queen g3. And now uh, 
Black uses the opportunity to take the pawn. The c6 knight ventured into d5, the queen tried to defend d6, and white accepts uh, a pawn sacrifice with, uh, with allowing knight takes e6. Knight takes e6. And now the point is that this knight actually reinforces the g5 square. So after h takes g5, uh, black of course doesn't have to recapture with the knight here immediately. He can interpose taking a piece and tactically have a sound position. So knight d5. After knight d5, if white recaptures the d5 knight, then, then a simple knight takes g5 would be almost winning for uh, for black, simply a pawn up in a much better position. You can see that white's pawn structure is ruined, so the only move for white is g takes h6. After g takes h6, the bishop is attacked. It has to do something, either go to either go here and lose and, and lose itself or go to f6. So the main move is bishop f6. Another thing you have to keep in mind with the black piece is now is that uh, the g7 square is tender. Now we can see how useful the move king h8 was. Firstly, you got your king out of harm's way in advance. Secondly, you can now use the g-file to your own advantage and place your rook there. So as I said, after knight takes d5, uh, taking the knight would be losing. So g h6, bishop f6, and now e d5, the knight has to move. Or uh, black needs to create a counter threat. A stronger threat than moving the knight immediately is bishop h4, gaining a tempo on the queen. Bishop h4. Queen g4, and now bishop takes e1 is the main move. You can also move the knight, but I think that taking the exchange is sounder, and this is now a forcing line, which you simply have to remember. Bishop e1, d6, bishop f2 check. And the king is going to go to f1, but you don't have any any useful discoveries. And here is what I would like, where I would like to stop. Let's just recap on the position. So from the bayonet attack, let's let's just go from the top, from the top. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6, knight f3, castles, bishop e2, e5, castles, knight c6, d5, knight e7, b4, the bayonet attack. We were now looking at the move knight h5, which is the main move. And after rook e1, f5, knight g5, knight f6, uh, we were now looking at the sideline f3, which is extremely forcing. After f3, you are going to get this position, which we just saw. If you assess the, this position, white has six pawn, pawns, black has five pawns, but his pawn structure is much better. White has uh, a huge weakness on e6, which is probably going to be captured at some point. He also has a, has a weak king. Uh, black has a weak king as well, but I think that the, the white king is going to be the first one in trouble. And the engines give this as better for white. Uh, but I believe that it's playable for black and that it requires precise play for uh, from, from both players. Of course... Black here has the exchange for, for the pawn, so materially he should be better, but it's really hard to justify that because the bishop pair is monstrous in this position looking at the, at the black king. So f3. If you want to play this position with white pieces, uh, f3. After f6, however, bishop f3 is the main move. After which, uh, black has a different strategy. After f3, he, he went king h8, and after rook b1, he went h6. Here, the point is to undermine... Uh, uh, white center. So black continues with the move c6. After c6, uh, white continues his development, bishop e3, h6 chasing the knight away once again, the knight goes into c6 as always in this variation, and black captures as always bishop e6, d6. And now we get a similar thing, f takes e4, instead of uh, f takes e4, which is now impossible, the pawn is not on f3, uh, white can either recapture with the knight or with the bishop. Knight takes is the best move, Knight takes, bishop takes, and now more than a hundred games from here, grandmaster games. This is now move 17, and the theory goes on for much longer. Uh, this is the first position where I, where I would like to stop and highlight the importance of black's next move. If you don't play this move, your position is going to be worse. If you don't play this move, white might try to stop it, and white might even succeed in stopping that. The move is d5. You need to use the opportunity to open up your pieces, take, uh, take a stand in the center and take up some space. So d5. White takes, cd5, cd5, bishop c2, the bishop was attacked, and now b6. Uh, after b6, queen g4, starting an attack on the g6 pawn, it's now attacked twice. e4, blockading the bishop, and you can see that black is overextended, there's a huge weakness on d5, white on the other hand has a huge weakness on e6. And most probably these positions are going to end up with black being a pawn up, but having a really weak uh, pawn to defend on d4. Rook ad1, queen c7, bishop b3, now double attacking the d5 weakness. Rook f5 defending. Rook e2, h5, queen h4, bishop f6, another attempt on the queen, queen g3. 
and now uh, black's best move is to decline the queen trade with bishop e5 and this i would say is the starting position of the variation this is uh, the theory you simply have to know if you think that this is playable for black then by all means go for this variation this is considered to be the strongest way for black to play in this position and i can't remember seeing any variation of the king's indian where on move 25 uh, black is equal or better this is all zeros according to the engines and playable for both sides of course once again i think it's much easier for for white to go wrong than for black to go wrong okay uh, i'm sorry if this was a lot of theory but the bayonet attack is a lot of theory and as i said the three lines you, you have to know all of them you need to know all the moves choose one with the black pieces that's the good thing if you if you face the bayonet attack you can you can choose one memorize one and practice it uh, for patrons, uh, there are going to be assignments going more in depth into the variations. I'm going to be sending over example games. And if you would like that extra content, check out the link in the description below. Uh, please let me know what you think about the variation. Uh, let me know if you like the bayonet attack for white and which defense you prefer for black. Uh, let me know if you've played it. Let me know if you know any interesting games and feel free to link them in, in the comments. And thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye bye.